I'm not sure which one this is. It's possibly the 17th or whatever, but the OME's annual community meeting. Um, amazing to see everyone here. Um, hopefully you all, yeah, it seems like many of you found the uh, OME background. So um, the portal's working and all that stuff. Um, just in case we'll, um, See, so I'll drop the community portal do, um, doc in the chat. Doubt that you guys could have gotten here without having it up. Thanks, uh, Josh. And without any other delays, I will start. So that should be fine. Let me see if I can open up the chat window. That. Right. Okay, let's get started. Um, welcome virtually to Dundee. It's great to see many of you, many um, um, faces that uh, we've known for many, many years. My name is Jason Swedlow. Um, with my colleagues, um, with my OME colleagues, we, uh, we're OME. Um, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this um, our community meeting. Um, we use this community meeting as an update on what we've been doing, but most importantly, a conversation. And as you'll see, hopefully, um, some real work towards um, some of the key problems um, in bioimaging informatics. So my job here um, this morning is to, um, first of all, welcome you, give you a quick OME update, um, and then um, we're going to bring in a couple um, other um, members of the consortium. First of all, Francis Wong, and then um, the Glencoe team to talk about what we've um, been doing over the last uh, year and a half or so. So without further ado, um, just to remind you some Zoom etiquette. This is copied from the document. Um, um, please do add your full name. Um, um you can you can um adjust your name um on the uh, using the participants button let me see if i can get a better view of participants there we go um you're welcome to uh add your affiliation as well just so we all um um everyone knows where you're from please do mute yourself um we have lots of uh, very lovely um uh co-hosts who will if you need to take another phone call, et cetera, we'll mute you. Um, uh, please do you please do use the chat. Um, try to um, interact there as much as much as possible. If you'd like to um, um, ask a question, either drop it into chat, we'll read it out, um, or invite you to speak up, or um, I'll just raise your hand. Um, any technical difficulties, use the chat box. Um, and probably the most important thing, so re please remember um, those sessions are being recorded and those recordings will be posted. We had a lot of debates about this, but as you'll see, I think one of the things that OME has, we've always been um, dedicated to is sort of being as inclusive and as engaging as possible. So we will post these um, recordings of these sessions um, um, on YouTube um, as soon as we have them. Do remember that private chats do end up being saved by the host. So things like, God, Swedlow is certainly, certainly looking old and things like that are fine and probably true, but um, they will, we will have a record of them. Okay. Um, and so finally, um, uh, uh, again, the URL for the portal document any issues, et cetera, um, email address. So without further ado, um, okay, so what are we doing um, in this meeting? We'll have um, four um, sessions uh, running Tuesday and Thursday this week um, and next week. Um, uh, today is really just an update on what OME and Glencoe is doing, talk, and then we'll move on to topics around um, all our work on NGFF, so the next generation file formats. Um, uh, we're running two sessions a day. You, you're welcome to join both of them. They will probably at least roughly be reruns. 
the thing, um, so one at scheduled from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. GMT and one at four to six GMT, we're trying to be as inclusive as possible. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we go on. Um, and so we're trying to catch Europe and um, um, Asia and Oceania in the morning session, or at least the UK morning session, and then um, Europe as well as um, North America, South America um, in the um, 4, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. GMT session. So that's the idea, okay? Um, so why are we doing this virtually? Um, and um, so we've had a few questions about this. Um, some of you have been reading the news and will know that actually there still is a pandemic going on with a large number of people being infected. And while for a lot of people, COVID infection is nothing more than a bad cold, there still is um, a significant amount of um, um, uh, chronic um, um, suffering. And so we, you know, we've had some experience of this within the team. Um, and I think it, it felt a little bit difficult to um, ask people to travel um, at this time, especially sort of late in the um, autumn, as we know, infection rates are starting to increase again. Um, the other issue, um, which I think is actually extremely important, um, is we found that by um, running um, virtual meetings, we got a much wider um, engagement, a much a wider audience. And so what I mean by wide, people from institutions that we had never engaged with that um, um, that may not have have had resources, for example, to travel um, all the way to um, our beloved Scotland for a meeting. And so I think, um, you know, while um, we um, absolutely love being together and spending a couple of days together, um, you know, the spirit of OME to try to be as, um, as open as possible and as engaging as possible um, um, fit this idea of a virtual meeting. And the final point, um, and I wasn't exactly sure how to phrase this. Um, I think when we started out these meetings, um, so that goes all the way back to 2006, 2007, but certainly through say 2010, 2015, um, there weren't, a, there were not a lot of forums for the bioimaging community to come together to talk about this problem of data, um, metadata, um, specifications and so on. Um, that has changed dramatically. And um, there are now many forums um, and many different organizations taking that forward. Um, Corep has been doing an amazing job just to, just to name one. And we now see the, um, um, the emergence of any national um, efforts um, um, to take forward um, data resources, data specifications. I'll just call out um, uh, German Bioimaging, um, their recent success with the NFDI for uh, bioimage is just one example of the, you know, just an incredible landscape of, of work, et cetera. Um, and so there's, there are lots of meetings ongoing, um, and so that, and many of us, many of us are participating those um, in, in those meetings. We wanted to focus on um, actually some specific sessions to, on um, work that we need to do, and so I think that was um, our focus was to 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 build these to build the the sessions um, more on this idea of trying to get work done. And so you'll see that over the next couple of days. If you have any comments about that or feedback, um, private, personally, uh, privately, you can spam me by email. Um, obviously, we can discuss it in the chat, um, or we, if you have questions about that, those ideas, um, just let us know. Okay. Okay. So um, let's, um, without further ado, kind of switch into the uh, review of what OME has been doing. I've shown this slide now, or versions of the slide for, um, I think, approaching two decades. Um, and so the problem, it, I, either that shows you how hard the problem is or how incompetent we are, one or the other, but, um, um, or maybe some combination of both, but um, imaging is, is everywhere as we know, I won't belabor that point in this audience. Um, imaging provides a um, really a um, kind of astounding um, quality of measurement. So the dynamic range, um, the variances that we deal with in imaging um, data. Many of our detectors and many of our systems are working at the, at the physical limit. So um, a lot of the data that we, collected, we collect are, is in fact, you know, shot noise or plus on limited. So it's actually quite an amazing technical achievement. Um, 
so we have spatial and temporally resolved uh, measurements of cells and tissues at a variety of different scales. Um, and we make those measurements um, uh, now um, at, at an extraordinary pace. And so there are many, just kind of looking through the faces here, there's many of you who um, uh, provide, build these systems, um, provide these systems to your um, uh, departments and scientists. And so the scale that we're all working on now is actually you know, quite astounding and certainly wasn't un, was unimaginable unimaginable when we started um, this project way back in 2000, 2002. So those measurements, um, we're all um, making those measurements on a daily basis. Our labs are enterprise data generators. Um, it raises the question of how you work at scale um, and how do those the data that we collect become a truly a resource um, for ourselves, actually for our own scientific um, ambitions as well as the wider community. And so those are the questions that are driving us forward. I thought I'd take you through a couple um, slides just to, you know, just to um, hopefully uh, frame what OME is doing. So this is um, a slide um, downloaded from the TCGA, the um, Cancer Genome Atlas in the United States um, built by the National Cancer Institute. Um, this is, uh, as you can see, this is adre adrenal um, adenocarcinoma. Um, this is an H&E stain whole slide image. And typically, you know, in, in, in analyzing these data, one will take some region and, you know, do some analysis and, for example, identify the positions of the nuclei and the boundaries of the, of the individual cells. And this is now, I would say, fairly standard and, just, you know, obviously just one example of the kinds of work that we're doing across um, the community. Obviously, what we're trying to do here is connect that, in this case, that masking or that segmentation with various results, with various, excuse me, measurements, um, which will be characteristics of the cells in these images and use those characteristics to understand the uh, mechanism of disease. And so um, this data, the data that we're handling is important because it enables these types of measurements and enables us to characterize um, cell states, tissue states, disease states, et cetera, and, 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 and to do so actually in an um, astoundingly um, accurate fashion. So many of you will know that, you know, what I'm showing you here is actually pre is becoming fairly routine. And I'll address that routine question towards the end of this um, presentation, because I think it's a critical issue. Um, so why is it that what we're doing in OME is important? And so the problem is, is that that image I just showed you, most of us are not working with a single image, but actually a large number of images and that scaling um, creates a whole bunch of problems as well as the need to connect that data. Um, and that's why the idea of informatics um, um, comes into play. I won't read through through this whole slide. There's lots of words. We have five dimensional data at least, and arguably sometimes uh, more dimensions. I think in OME, we've seen up to seven dimensions. Um, these data sets are demonstrably large and sort of comparison to what, you know, uh, we normally deal with in our personal lives. This is actually, these data are actually substantially, um, you know, truly big. Um, there's all of the associated metadata, access control, oops, excuse me, um, um, et cetera, lots of formats. Um, I want to call out here the, the, um, the commercial providers of, of technologies. I do, I do not in any way mean to provide any criticism here. The formats that are being generated by um, a lot of the commercial systems are actually quite powerful, but they tend to be optimized more for right access um, and for example, analysis with a specific set of tools as opposed to a much more generic and um, shareable um, um, uh, uh, sort of set of requirements. Um, obviously it's a very rapidly innovating field and we actually have a lot of, we actually you know, have challenges with just being uh, flexible um, with respect to data policies, different workflows, et cetera. So, you know, it would be fine if all we had to do is to analyze, you know, five or ten images of a specific kind, and that was a, um, that was uh, sufficient for our scientific ambitions. But it's simply not, and so it's that it, the re, the scale that we're working on, the diversity of problem spaces that we're working on, the need to integrate all this data is why this informatics challenge comes um, on board. 
And so um, OME has been working on that challenge now for uh, over 20 years. Um, and so I've, I've shown this slide now many times, um, this idea of um, OME providing interaction between the different um, functionalities you see on the periphery of this um, slide. Um, and we succeed when effectively these different functions that are naive one from um, uh, that were constructed in a way that's naive of one another um, uh, um, interact um, and actually start to work together. Um, so that is our overall goal and that's what we've been doing now for um, since about 2002. So a quick review of what of our technology, these are words that many of you will know, but just to give you, um, just to kind of uh, lay the foundation. Um, so these are words you can find on Google. Um, these are all effectively products of the OME, um, um, of the OME consortium. There's, there are either data specifications, um, for example, the data model or various file formats or translators, et cetera. Um, these are all open source and available um, to the community. Um, and so we start with the data specification up top, moving all the way down, for example, IDR, which you'll hear about from Francis in a few minutes, um, uh, a full-blown um, um, data publication system. So just to sort of put this into uh, the, some of these ideas into context, so the bottom of the slide is probably what's sitting at most of your institutions. So you all have an amazing... Um, capacity for imaging um, systems, and you'll have your institutional um, uh, capabilities for storing that data, whatever that is. Um, we know that there's lots of lots and lots and lots of different file formats. Um, I'm not gonna um, go too much into the details here, um, but um, we, we count on the order of 150 um, distinguishable formats. Um, we can talk about the details there, but um, Bioformats is an open source um, file format translator. So it reads the binary data, reads the um, metadata into a common model. So think of this as a single interface to this you know, wide range of different data that's sitting um, on your um, file system. Lots of people use bioformats for lots of different applications. We take bioformats and put a marrow on top of it and a marrow is a full-blown data management system. So including ways of storing the metadata, the permissions, access, various associated um, data with this. Um, connections are secure. Um, uh, and um, we'd argue at least to, to a reasonable extent scalable. And we can talk about the details of that. Um, Chris Allen um, and team from Glencoe will talk about what they've been doing um, with that scalability here in a few minutes. So uh, Amero ends up being another interface. And so note that when we were looking at that TCGA image, we could just, you know, we'd be fine just looking at the direct, at, at the file directly on the storage system because we were only looking at one file and one type of file. But now we have these interfaces to, ha to handle the diversity of different data types and the diversity of different access uh, mechanisms and the diversity of different metadata structures that we have to handle. And having done all that, we can now actually put you know, people and tools on top of all of that. So it um, becomes possible to have ways of sharing data across teams, across collaborators, et cetera, um, connecting data into um, various um, um, analysis tools, um, AI, et cetera. Now, I don't want to, I don't, what I don't want to say, and so many of you are here are, um, you know, technically skilled, uh, this is a this this is a reasonable representation of one idea of the type of architectures we can build. But as many of you will be aware, those aware there's many different types of architectures emerging. So this could get much much more complex. So treat this as more of a conceptual idea of how to build um, um, build these tools. And I think you'll see examples of much more complex and and uh, probably much more um, uh, advanced and scalable um, uh, approaches over the next couple of days. Okay, so just to show you all of that in action. So here is a screenshot of Amero. So just going back. So I'm, you know, I'm a user up here with a laptop connecting into this whole system and taking screenshots from my laptop. Um, what does that look like? So this is high content screening data. Um, this is actually from the um, Broads um, BBBC collection uh, imaging data from um, um, 
um, from different wells on a multi-well plate. Uh, on the right side here, this is um, actually uh, analytic metadata calculated from cell profiler. So connecting data organization with imaging data with metadata um, all in a single system. This is the same application, in fact, the same instance of the application, but now looking at whole slide imaging data, this is the TCGA data set. So this is bioformats in action. So looking at different types of data and providing that, that ability to shift across these um, different modalities. And note that metadata structures here have changed. These are, these are TCGA data, these are analytics coming out of, um, um, that are relevant to the, um, uh, to the um, H&E uh, stained images. And finally, this is kind of an extreme example, but obviously DICOM data with DICOM tags um, being um, presented in the, um, uh, on, on, on the, in the metadata window. So showing the flexibility of, of, of these different interfaces and how they can handle these different data types. Okay, so uh, many of you will, that'll be familiar to many of you. Um, so that's interoperability with different imaging data. Um, Omero can connect to many different analytic tools and here are some of them. I won't belabor this too much, um, other to say that um, Jean-Marie and team have um, been doing a lot of work on this and there's a lot of um, information on this of, um, on Read the Docs and um, refer you to the um, link there. Okay, so that's all fine. Um, we build the software, we um, use it ourselves. We, um, Francis will show you more about that in a second. Um, I think one of the most gratifying things is, is that um, it's not just us using the software. Here's a few a few publications I've pulled. Most of these are from 2022. And the point here is not to um, highlight any specific applications, but show you sort of the diversity of, of, of ways of different groups using Amaro. And in general, I think these are groups that we had no idea existed. Um, and so um, it was, we think based on various metrics, it was on the order of several thousand installations of Amaro worldwide working at various scales. And we don't collect any of the, the data around installations. So if you ask us how much data is under management under Amaro, we don't formally know the answer, but it's got to be in the many, many hundreds of terabytes, probably um, into the petabytes um, worldwide. Um, and I just want to call out, um, there's several members of the community here um, who have been taking Amaro and then sort of uh, working with it in various ways. This is, um, um, this is a video um, from um, uh, Sophie um, Abelanay's group. Um, and it was, just, it was great to see um, ideas of how to um, engage with the um, user community with the marrow coming out of many of the micro microscopy facilities that um, provide the system. And I'll say more about this in a second, but I think this type of um, engagement with users is probably one of the most important things that we should be doing in the future. So um, just to um, uh, sort of point to, um, where we're all going. I really have to um, uh, thank uh, the team that's here today. Um, amazingly dedicated um, um, group. It's fair to say I was going through these. Uh, yeah, these pictures are from, um, we have, it's been a while um, since we've been able to all get everybody together and take pictures of us. So some of these are um, yeah, from, a, from a few years ago, let's just put it that way. But in any case, um, it's, an, it's been a real privilege to work with such an amazing team. This is the team as it um, work um, as constructed now. Um, several past team members you can find on the um, website. And so they're the reason that everything that you have um, seen, uh, that you, everything that you know of and that you will see over the next uh, few days um, exists. And so I'm very grateful. Um, to them, and a whole crew of um, collaborators in um, many different institutions worldwide and really enjoying um, uh, working with that global um, community. Okay, quickly, um, since our last meeting, a list of the various releases. Um, these are obviously um, all open source and um, um, real credit to the team and all of their work. Um, some of these are fairly routine as we're working through point releases, for example, of bioformats. Some of them are more, more important, for example, security releases, et cetera. I'm sorry, more important is probably the wrong word to phrase it, but many of you will understand the, the um, you know, when, it, when, when a security issue appears, that um, is a quite a moment, a sort of all hands on deck moment. And um, 
very much appreciate um, how the team has responded um, at those times. Um, so I won't belabor that too much. Um, what I will do now, um, so my time is up and what I'm gonna do is hand over to Francis Wong who will tell you about, um, I think a significant amount of work that we've been doing on the image data resource. Um, I'll remind you that over the next few days, um, NG, um, um, discussions on various uses and um, applications of the NGFF technology. Um, after Francis um, um, is finished, I'll come back and do a couple slides on training and outreach because I think this is a really important um, part of the um, future of where we need to go, certainly as OME, but also as a community. Very happy to discuss that. Um, and then um, uh, Chris Allen, um, uh, Aaron Deal, and Emil uh, Rospici are going to come in and um, tell you about what's been going on with uh, Glencoe Software. So um, without any further ado, Francis, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks, Jason. And there are no questions so far, which either means that you're all still working on your coffee or that was abundantly clear. Okay, can you guys hear me? Excellent. Okay, so yes, good morning, everyone. And um, as Jason mentioned, um, my name is Francis Wong. I am happy to be giving um, this year's update on IDR. For those of you new to IDR, um, IDR is a public image resource and our vision is to work towards making image data generated by the scientific community publicly available and reusable via image archives and databases. IDR has been working to achieve this goal by making our image data publicly accessible at idr.openmicroscopy.org. Working with reference datasets, which are complete datasets containing molecular and functional annotations that are associated with an existing or upcoming publication. By integrating studies or datasets with other datasets, such as through genes, compounds, or phenotypes, having curated metadata, and enabling data reanalysis via the cloud. IDR currently has 32 million image files over 89,000 genes and 40,000 compounds. This amounts to 335 terabytes of imaging data. And since the start of 2019, the data volume growth has been about 75 terabytes per year. In reality, this translates to over 110 studies cross-published in different journals and cross-referenced via accessions and DOIs. Now let's look at some imaging data. So here are a few cell and tissue studies to give you a taste of the types of data we have in IDR. Starting at the top left with this data set from the Human Protein Atlas, published by Yulin et al. Under IDR 43, you can see high resolution human tissue sections where protein expression has been mapped across all major tissues and organs in the human body. This is one of the largest data sets in IDR, measuring over 145 terabytes in size. We currently hold 11,000 antibodies from the Human Protein Atlas, which is about a third of the total antibodies we expect to receive. So this is a growing data set in IDR where we will release additional antibodies in batches. IDR also has several light sheet microscopy data sets, ranging from one to 10 terabytes in size. One example is IDR44 on the top right, which is a study mapping cell fates in the mouse embryo. This data set is a reference data set submitted by McDowell et al. It very nicely captures mouse development at the single cell level. Moving down to the bottom left, IDR47, is a yeast single cell transcription profiling data set from Gregor Neurt's lab, the goal of the study was to generate data sets for single cell transcription modeling. And moving across to the bottom right, IDR94 is a large scale drug screen on human cells to identify inhibitors of SARS-CoV-2 by Ellinger et al at the Fraunhofer Institute. IDR has recently received a few multi-omics data sets and we published IDR123 earlier this year 
This is a multicolor iFish dataset showing simultaneous visualization of DNA loci in single cells by Mota et al. The submitters also provided 3D coordinates for nearly 10,000 fish dots, and IDEA worked with the 4 dn community to use a standard fish omics format for this dataset, such as Spot ID, Chrome Start, and Chrome End. Another example of multi-omics um, data in IDR is IDR101. Here we have an in situ genome sequencing dataset of human fibroblasts by Payne et al. These images show the spatial localization of hundreds to thousands of DNA sequences in individual cells. You can also download the sequence metadata as a table for each cell, and this greatly enriches the dataset and allow users to reuse this data for their own purpose. In fact, this is exactly what happened. Jean Ma and his group accessed this data from IDR and used it in their Nucleome browser to show an example of interactive navigation of in situ genome sequencing data. So the Nucleome browser is an interactive multimodal data visualization platform for 4D Nucleome research. And this has recently been, been published in Nature Methods for anyone interested in finding out more about it. So we at IDR were delighted when we discovered that this data set had been reused in such a valuable way. And we hope that the scientific community continues to find valuable data sets in IDR and to reuse these for further um, scientific developments. So IDR um, imaging data for all studies published in IDR is available for download using the SPARA protocol. And IDR's mission is to make reference image data sets as widely available as possible. Therefore, the majority of IDR datasets are published under a CCBY license. The CCBY license allows anyone to copy, distribute, and adapt the work as long as the credit is given to the creator. So IDR studies published under this permissive license allow users to share and use the data. Now I'd like to show you a workflow example of obtaining information from one resource and then coming to IDR to find image data related to this information. So IDR has published this example in Workflow Hub. In this example, we start with the resource HumanMind. HumanMind is an integrated database of human genomic data where you can search for genes and proteins, etc. So you can find information from this resource, such as identifying genes of interest. Then you can come to IDR with your gene list, ask a specific biological question, and see the images in IDR for these genes. So an example question could be, which diabetes-related genes are expressed in pancreas? And to start answering this question, we obtain a list of diabetes-related genes expressed in the pancreas from human mind. Then we use the IDR Multiomics API to search for images in IDR associated with this gene list. Taking PDX1 as an example, here you can see the IDR images linked to the PDX1 gene and we have images at four different developmental stages. These images are from IDR70 by Kerwin et al. And we were able to retrieve these images from a search query as they have been annotated with a gene name and gene symbol. And this leads me on to ontologies. There's a common question that people often ask us is, what ontologies should I use? We don't have a definitive answer for this, but I can tell you the public ontologies we are using in IDR. So for organism, we use the NCBI taxonomy. For study type, high content screen types and protocol, we use the EFO. For imaging method, we use the FBBI. And for phenotype, we use the CMPO. For gene, we use either Ensemble or NCBI gene. And for protein, we use Uniprot. And recently, IDR has been receiving more clinical data and compound screens. So we have been using StoMed CT for clinical data and PubChem for compounds. This is a list of the types of metadata which IDR can provide links to, and this in turn creates rich data sets with added value for our users. Now let's have a look at the IDR homepage. We have made a few changes to it this year. We hope you like them. Um, one change is the addition of the image panel. It shows a thumbnail for each study in IDR. So there are currently 114 thumbnails representing the 114 individual studies. And when you click on a thumbnail, you'll see a pop-up window for the study, 
like this one for IDR18. Now the pop-up, um, yeah, the pop-up window provides different links to different aspects of the study. So if you click on the eye icon on the top right um, hand corner of the image, it will open the image in the IDR image viewer. And from here, you will be able to view all images um, of this data set. Or you can access the image files and metadata for the study by clicking on the number of experiments, and in this case, one experiment. And if the paper for the study is published, the authors will be shown in blue, as seen here for Keenan et al. And this will take you directly to the publication in PubMed. And if the authors are greyed out, this means the paper is not yet published, but the link will be updated when the paper is published. The most recent change to our homepage is the search box, where you can now type in a term without selecting a search field. So for example, if you type in PAX, the search will also populate the best matches to this term, and then you can select to see the images for PAX 6, PAX 7, etc. So apart from the ease of just typing in your term into a free text box, we've made this change because behind the scenes, we have been working to improve the functionality and performance of search for IDR. So for example, search is now more responsive and gives results much faster. However, this is a work in progress and we will be rolling out incremental changes over the coming months to continue to improve search for IDR. This does bring me to the end um, for this year's update. But for those of you who would like to submit data to IDR, this slide shows a brief overview of the data submission process. If you have a reference data set you would like to submit to IDR, the first step is to send an email to IDR at openmicroscopy.org. Once we confirm your data set as a reference data set um, suitable for IDR, we will ask you to upload the original raw image files to us. You'll also need to fill in metadata templates. When all checks have passed, the data set is scheduled for release and then published in IDR. Now to quickly summarize, the IDR is publicly available curated studies submitted by the community in a searchable scalable platform that links metadata and enables reanalysis that can be deployed by others. This just leaves me to thank our funders and everyone on the IDR team. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. that was great. Um, I'm going to stop there. Um, I have a little bit more to go through on my side, but um, any questions in particular for Francis? Lots of clapping hands. I will. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> Um, okay, so I don't see any raised hands. So Francis, that was great. Um, I'm gonna take back over just for a couple slides to tell you sort of directions we're going. Um, actually, Francis, there's a question from Julian um, Inopec. Um, great work. Is the IDR search using the normal Amaro search in the back end? Um, Francis, do you want to start with that and perhaps um, bring in other members of the team? Sure. Um, thanks, Jason. Yeah. No, this is a the new search is um, so the back end of it is using Elasticsearch, um, and IDEA previously used Mapper, so that was a lot slower. So, um, as I mentioned, we're working to improve it. So Elasticsearch is much faster. And um, yeah, so it's a new search altogether. Um, so yeah, I don't know if um, Khaled, which is who's been working on the Elastic Search, wants to add anything. We have created some uh, backend API using uh, Python. It is using the Elastic Search, which indexing the Omero database into a Elastic Search index. And we can use some EBI to search uh, uh, the metadata, which is key value pairs. We have we can use uh, many operators such as equal, not equal, contain, not contains, and such in. 
and also we can combine, com, make, we can make uh, com, complex search such as and or and so on. So we have more capabilities uh, in the Elasticsearch than the uh, old uh, Omero search engine. Thanks, Khaled. And yeah. I think something else to add. Sorry, JM, do you want to add? I was going no, to say that. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say we're going to, we've been testing this on IDR, but we'll be rolling like this out in Omero like later on. So just to answer that question, but over to you, JM. That's what I was going to clarify. It was easier to start in IDR because it's less disruptive in terms of uh, otherwise require a lot of changes in Omero web. So it's it will it will be rolled out. It will go down into the standard OME uh, when we are ready. We're still making improvements to it on IDR at the moment. So yeah, it's a work in progress. And we welcome any feedback and comments. Thank you. Anything else, guys? If not, I'm going to continue just for a couple more slides, and then we'll switch over to the Glencoe team. So, um, so that was Francis. I think the one thing I wanted to add, so in case it wasn't blindingly obvious, um, so IDR is um, obviously built on top of Bioformats and Amaro, um, so it should look um, somewhat familiar. Um, to you, um, you know, the from an OME perspective, you know, reasons to build IDR were I think we were very interested in trying to drive a new way of um, sharing data in the bioimaging community, um, and um, you know, so hopefully that's um, um, that's been useful. It also gives us a chance to test our own software to, if you will, use our own software at significant scale. And you saw the numbers from Francis that we're working at. So um, we have a day-to-day -day experience with, you know, um, performance, um, how import works, et cetera. Um, and so that's uh, pretty important for us. Um, it also gives us um, ways of introducing new functionality like research um, uh, capabilities, uh, Francis and team were just discussing. Okay, so there's um, IDR. IDR is running it um, um, at EMBL EBI. We're very appreciative of um, EBI's uh, provision of their embassy cloud um, for um, the IDR system. I would say one sort of at a slightly higher level, um, IDR has been um, part of this evolving ecosystem of um, public data, public bioimage data repositories. And here were um, the ideas for this um, we published with our colleagues from um, EMBL 2018 um, and um, have been working now um, in particular with Matthew um, Hartley and um, team at EBI um, to build interlinks with, between the um, IDR and the bioimage archive. And Matthew's here and I'm sure he could answer any questions about that project if you're interested in that. We've also been working with uh, Shuichi Onami's team at Riken um, uh, in um, Kobe, Japan on their SSBD system. And so following the same idea of an archive or repository on the one hand, and then an added value, um, a highly curated added value um, database on the other and working through the ideas and the mechanisms for um, constructing those systems, running them at scale and making the most out of the metadata. So I'm not gonna go into too much of the details of that, um, that um, a lot of that has been published um, at least um, at a high level. Um, we're just starting a new um, um, a collaboration with the, um, with the Recon team on some of the metadata questions and um, um, have uh, several um, and have various proposals um, submitted for um, um, IDR and the Bioimage Archive with uh, Matthew and team. So just to give you an idea of how all, all that's working. Uh, okay, don't see any new questions. So, um, so um, one thing that I think is extremely important, um, <laughs> um, it gets to this, um, I think, I think an increasingly important issue that we've seen in OME and it, it has emerged across the community, various surveys, et cetera. So it's all very fine and well to declare yourself, you know, that you have fair data, et cetera. But if no one knows how to use it, 
you know, does it matter? And I, I mean, you know, this is sort of a, a tongue in cheek uh, question, but I think it's actually a deeply serious point. Um, and so there has been this large push for um, so-called fair imaging data, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. And those, those words are, you know, important, et cetera. But uh, one of the things that we have seen is, is that in fact, data might be um, uh, meet, you know, these various criteria, but how experimentalists, data analysts, um, um, and the wider community of imaging scientists access these data, what tooling exists, how do they solve their problems, um, is, is not something to take for granted, it actually requires a substantial amount of, um, a substantial amount of work. And so in the lead up to um, uh, uh, lockdown, um, uh, huge credit to Peter Volchesko, for example, in the two years before lockdown, Peter was quite the world traveler running um, training, um, um, uh, training workshops um, for um, um, users of various types. So users who were um, experimentalists or data analysts or sysadmins um, or um, uh, software developers. I think that's a really important um, uh, think, uh, lesson we learned through this is that um, you know, all users are, are, are not cut from the same cloth. And so you know, we actually have to tailor what we're doing to uh, many different types of environments um, and, and needs. Um, so this was uh, Peter, um, uh, uh, I guess you can imagine Peter's carbon footprint um, from this slide, but um, it was a de definite effort to um, engage a wide variety of um, users. And I have to say, you know, here Peter is, um, and you can ask him more about this, but you know, we are demonstrating um, obviously uh, Amero, but um, Fiji, um, QPath, Cell Profiler, and several applications um, all together, and wherever possible, linking um, at using public data from IDR, from Bioimage Archive, et cetera. And so trying to, to drive this idea of um, public access to data. Obviously that all went virtual when we, um, um, uh, a lot, um, um, when the pandemic happened and, and, and those virtual um, workshops ha have been ongoing and we'll start where um, Peter's starting to uh, go on the road again uh, to various um, 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 meetings and workshops. But I just wanted, you know, so in thinking about the need for actually more user training, et cetera, I want to highlight this figure from um, this survey from the, um, for bioimaging North America that's published um, uh, late 2021. And so this is one of the figures where, um, and I have to thank Martin Jones from the Crick for um, point, pointing this out because I think it's a really deeply important point. So the survey was asking tool creators as well as tool users. And so they were differentiating in these responses. Um, and so note that you they can ask tool cre um, um, creators, what, you know, you know, what do, what do you, so what do you think tool creators should do? And so note that um, what, what the number of, the number of keywords that were sort of um, included in those responses. So things like documentations, tutorials of workshops, accessibility. Um, if you ask, what do you think tool users could do? Oh, okay, well, they need to learn, <laughs> learn how to use those tools, tutorials, best practices encourage, understand, share these words, which are all saying that, you know, there's a desperate need for engagement and connection between both the, um, the very powerful um, um, cap um, technologies that, that we have, both on the sort of data management and data analytics side, but then we need to somehow connect those to, um, to the problem spaces. And so I think, so I, I can tell you that in OME, we will be working very hard over the next little while to, to put even more effort into this um, engagement question. Cause I think um, we can talk a lot about, I'll just tell you my personal opinion and happy, happy to discuss this um, is that we can talk lots and lots and lots about um, specific technologies or AI models or whatever. And that's, I don't, don't mean to diminish that in any way, it's very important. But if those tools can't, if, if we can't bring our users to those tools, and so yes, we need better UIs, et cetera. But I think a critical thing, and certainly in OME we have seen, a critical uh, point is we need to bring those users up um, uh, to sometimes improve their skills, 
uh, to help them understand um, the ways that um, we're working and to understand the, the, the tooling that's um, um, out there, especially in the open source and the commercial spaces. So um, I think that's where we'll be putting a lot of our effort um, over the next um, um, a couple of years. So I think, um, so just that's um, we're um, the OME side of this is done. We're gonna hand over to the Glencoe team here in a second. Um, just to remind you, today is this OME and Glenco update. Um, Thursday, um, we'll, we'll switch over to focusing on um, the NGFF um, question. So uh, interested in looking at the landscape for viewers for the NGFF formats. We have a metadata session on the 15th and um, looking at um, support for um, uh, Java support for OMIZAR. Again, these sessions are running from 8 a.m. to 10, 10 a.m. GMT, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. GMT. I assume you can do the time zone um, conversions for wherever you are. And without further ado, I'm going to stop. I'll just ask questions. Maybe I'll just go back. Any question? Any other questions? Anyone on, raised hands from that from the OME side of this? And if not, I don't see any raised hands. I don't see any new questions in the chat. So if, if you have questions as we go along, please drop them in the chat. And I am gonna hand over to Chris Allen, Aaron Deal and Emil Rosbichi for an update from Glencoe. So take it away, Chris. Thanks, Jason. Just gonna get going here. There's actually a question from Stefan. Jason, I don't know if you want to take it. Uh, I'm missing well, it. So somebody. The handout, the handout disappeared. Sorry. Maybe. Stefan, did you have a question? No? Okay. All right. Chris, over to you. Take it away. Thanks, Jason. It's nice to see everyone. I'm sure we'll see even more people over the next couple of weeks. Uh, so we thought it apt to do a collaboration update. We didn't uh, do one at the last OME meeting. Um, so this will follow a kind of, if you've been to a few OME meetings, this will follow a kind of similar pattern, at least for me. Uh, and then I'll hand over to Emil uh, here this morning, and both Aaron and Emil uh, this afternoon. Um, if you don't know, we have a sort of new structured leadership team uh, at Glencoe Software with myself, Emil, and Aaron uh, handling basically our engineering efforts, our efforts uh, towards new and existing applications, as well as kind of productizing some of the infrastructure that, that we've built. So um, that's quite exciting. And you'll get to hear from both of them again this afternoon and Emil this morning on uh, things that we're doing. Uh, so just for those who don't uh, know or might be new, I will run through just a brief outline of who Glen Glencoe Software is and what we do. Uh, do a little overview of what uh, we achieved over the last uh, 12 to 16 months. Say a little bit about future directions and then hand over to um, Emil for the public roadmap of what we're planning to do up until the end of the year and in the beginning part of 2023. That'll include a little bit of an application showcase of some of the tools that we're building on top of OME technology, both on the file format side uh, and the application side. So just briefly, uh, who is Glencoe Software? We are the exclusive commercial partner of the open microscopy environment. Uh, we have a pretty wide distributed team across going as far west uh, as the sort of central states of the United States and as far east as Poland. And it's where kind of where our, our team is structured uh, with a wide cross section of expertise in a whole bunch of different domains. And we have a pretty wide customer base now across of variety of different types of organizations. Um, 
and a variety of different sort of locations that are around the, around the globe, including uh, some in Australia. So what does Glencoe software really do? Well, we sit kind of at this interface between the, the sort of commercial licensing community and the open source um, project. And the thing that allows us to function and deliver solutions into that space is a synergy, a open source focused synergy between ourselves and uh, the OME community. And what we do is build on top of that uh, those efforts. We sell commercial licenses of OME technology. We do customization, and you'll see a lot of uh, that from Emil here in a little bit of tools we build on top that uh, are focused on specific domains. And increasingly, we're sort of delivering a holistic uh, solution where we are also working at uh, a variety of different levels in these organizations to help them not only have the technology available, but really harness it uh, as best they can. That means integration with all sorts of tooling throughout the organization, including you know, lab notebooks and, and all those types of things. Okay. Uh, one sort of theme you'll hear from me as well as from uh, Emil and Aaron is an increasing participation from Glencoe Software on core parts of OMI technology. We know that there's a variety of uh, client and server components that we need to evolve. Um, and we're putting the team in place in, in order to do that. So we kind of have a bit of a trifecta uh, that allows us to deliver solutions in the domains that we're most focused on. That is a commercially licensed uh, enterprise data management system. You guys will know this as Omero. We call our version Omero Plus, and it has a variety of bells and whistles that sit on top. We have a bioformats, of course, and then a series of domain-specific tooling, the most prominent one being PathViewer, which is a visualization and analysis platform for digital pathology. And really what Glencoe Software focuses on is a image-centric view of the world. Now, this is kind of part and parcel to the way that OME functions, but we really try and lean into that and expand that uh, to more components of the organization than you know you would traditionally think of the software uh, being exposed to. And that means we're not just trying to deliver solutions to one or two parts of this, and our two main domains are high content screening and digital pathology. And what we're really trying to do is to bring all of these different people together in a solution and to have those solutions revolve around the images themselves. Things hang, are hanging off of the images or are related to, to the images. It's the, the sort of uh, water cooler uh, for all of the all of the data here. And, and again, sort of in this community, we're trying to bring all of those different people together around the solution. And that's the same for digital pathology. The, the names are different, but the concepts uh, are very similar, trying to bring all of those, those people together. Right? So quickly, uh, what we've really achieved and worked towards over the last uh, 12 to 16 months, just things that we said last, last year that we were really going to focus on uh, expanding OME and GFF in particular into uh, geometry and analytics, uh, extending and expanding upon all of our conversion tool infrastructure for OME and GFF and the microservices that we use as part of Omero Plus, and critically build new applications on top of the this technology. If we it's not enough to have the infrastructure, we need to have good examples uh, in these domains. Okay, so here's a brief timeline. I'm not going to go through all these elements. Emil and Aaron will. Uh, give you some real nice um, highlights here. But, you know, the, the focus was really to try and drive home a, a lot of these uh, elements that we talked about, release real software, uh, but also participate critically in the sort of evangelism, if you will, of OME technology and uh, both in terms of which applications are built upon it, but also go out in the community and um, and talk about them. 
So in, you know, in terms of what we actually concretely did, uh, again, some highlights released a series of new products that allow us to bring regions of interest from commercial tools, uh, into NGFF, uh, made a couple path viewer releases to really harness that. And you'll see some screenshots from Emil on that. Um, we know that OME NGFF and the sort of neutral file format space needs tooling in order to do conversion. It needs tooling that represents the latest specifications, et cetera. So, you know, building all of that together. We added NGFF support to Omero Plus so that we can work with things natively and critically work at the entire um, data process, I guess, um, you know, at various different levels and, you know, continue to build on uh, new applications. So we're lucky to have David Sterling on the team and that has allowed us to, to really work with the cell profiler team and try to get native NGFF support into there. And we'll be continuing to do that across a wide, wide cross section of tooling. As I mentioned, we're trying to really bolster the team to allow us to contribute even more to the open source community. That means, you know, team expansion. And we've really, you know, done that over the, over the last 12 months, um, but also uh, going out to the community and talking about what we're doing. As far as where to go from here and what we'd like to do again over the next sort of 12 to, to 14 months, um, compression's a big uh, discussion point, I think across the entire community at the moment, especially in the digital pathology one, what to do about that, how to work with that and how that compression technology works with object storage and also how that compression technology works with the existing compression technology that's being used in that space. And we've got a variety of projects ongoing now in, in order to, to try and address some of that, something that I think the NGFF community at the moment is, it's not like there it's being ignored, but the focus really is, is on a lot of fluorescence uh, data, which often, you know, isn't compressed uh, or is certainly compressed in a lossless fashion. Need to continue to explore, explore, expand um, and explore new ways for ONG, OMI and GFF to be used. Uh, as I mentioned, taking that more active role in some of the core, core development, pushing some, some core functionality. Um, we're going to continue to expand the team. We need to be able to service even more of the uh, different uh, pieces of the ecosystem. Um, we are hiring new staff, and you'll hear from Emil and specifically on what on what those are those positions are here in a second. And, you know, as things open up after COVID and we have more of these uh, opportunities uh, to evangelize the technology, we're going to continue to do that. Um, we've got new domains as well for, for Path Viewer we really want to harness. So it's a kind of a, uh, it'll be a big 12 months for us trying to, to do all these things. And hopefully I'll be able to come back here in 12 months and, uh, rattle off all the exciting things that, that we've been able to do. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Emil, let him give you the more exciting, um, view with uh, screenshots and examples of, of what we've done. So thanks, Chris. I'll do over my to you, best Emil. for sure. Okay. Where do I have this guy? I think it's here. Okay, so as Chris, thanks Chris again for the great intro. Uh, so in the next few minutes, I'll try to summarize the work and the foundations we laid in 2022 for all the work that that we're looking um, doing in the in the next 12 to 18 months. So this will be really the introduction of the of the publicly facing roadmap of Glenco Software. Kind of the mission we've set to to ourselves a goal is is to pro, uh, to to make an Omero Plus or the Omero Plus the global data management solution. So I'll start um, the first slide. I might just switch off my camera, guys, to give you the best resolution from these slides as we go along. Um, so I'll start by introducing the, uh, and saying what actually does it mean to be a global data management solution and, and what it will take to, to make Omero um, a truly global solution. So 
in these days, it is not unusual for us uh, um, to see that the acquisition, the processing, and the analysis does not really happen uh, at the same geographical location. So we have multi-site deployments um, that need to connect the teams together and the data that's located at multiple sites. So it's, it's an absolute requirement these days. Um, for the last 18 months, maybe more, we've been observing a really strong trend in migrating the data and the compute infrastructure into the cloud. And, um, and that's why providing actually the cloud native deployments or cloud native Omera Plus with the first class object storage support uh, has become incredibly important for us. And as Omero Plus becomes kind of the conduit for all the interactions with the data, and not only by the end users, but also by various uh, third party applications, we must provide new ways of authentication and authorization. Um, for example, application access tokens, that's, that's another must um, requirement to, to actually think about global data management solution. We think that with those requirements, we'll be able to, or new features, we'll be able to provide a truly modular architecture that will fulfill those multi-site deployment, cloud native nature and, and authorization and scaling uh, requirements. Uh, obviously, this brings some challenges um, when we think about the global data management solution. So as Omero becomes this trusted and adopted um, um, data management application, uh, we have to really think about and, and make sure that we have really good integration with things like image processing tools, because your data is now localized at multiple sites. We need to know how to deploy and run these tools to not Again, we all know cloud is really expensive. Running these tools is even more expensive than you can think. So we need to make sure that, that, that we do all of our work properly there and, and optimize these things. Um, and better integration for us doesn't necessarily mean just the image access to the, pix, uh, to, to the pixel data, but actually very often full bi bi-directional integration. That's kind of where possible, but that's really expected from our customers. That includes metadata exchange, the mask and label image creation, handling and processing of the analytical results. And shifting, as you know, the large amounts of image data is expensive, but it's exactly the same for the analytical data. These days, we often generate with, even with our own segmentation tools, more analytical data than there's original raw data. So um, we need to make sure that we provide a way to interact with this data where it is, uh, which effectively means for Omero, if, it need, if, if we want to make this a global data management solution, we'll have to provide the modernized architecture that will be able to handle the analytical data um, with data science ready Omero tables API, um, new Omero web plugins, for example, for interacting with this data. Um, as Chris described, our key domains really are high content screening and digital pathology, and that's that's kind of our focus for the next 12 to 18 months, also for the analytical workflow. And one of the most important aspects of, of that modernized infrastructure is to make sure that we can also provide uh, tailored solutions for, for our key domains. That also includes things like spatial genomics and large three-dimensional data sets, of course. And for these very large scale installations, um, the management of these systems, of course, and monitoring becomes a challenge. So we'd like to also, and I'll show you this in a second, to provide the data managers and the system administrators with the information they require to perform their kind of day-to-day -day activity and make sure that the system is actually performing the way they want to uh, perform it and they deliver uh, the value to the end users. Um, so in 2022, we've kind of, we're thinking about how to transform Omero Plus and become the global data management solution um, we started to lay the foundation for this particular uh, mission. Sorry, no, oh, just going too many slides at the same time. Uh, so we have tackled these two fu fundamental problems. The first one was to make sure that Omero can be delivered as a cloud native solution. That means for us support for the object storage and the OME and GFF format. Um, new authentication capabilities, that's mostly single sign-on. We observe this um, daily. So we have uh, a new customer every week coming to us saying, hey, it's time to actually do the single sign-on for us as well. So, so far we've been, we've been using LDAP mostly, but these days, um, if you're already logged in in your browser into one application, why not to be logged in into, into other applications? That becomes a must for us as well. So we deliver already 
SAML and OAuth protocol integration into Omero Plus uh, capabilities. And I'll talk about it more uh, in a second as well. But the second problem we, we had to solve was increasing need of performing more complex and expensive tasks, uh, tasks on the server side. That includes um, the workflows described in here in the slide. So file stitching, file conversion, uh, large-scale imports, image segmentation, ingestion of third-party analysis results, especially in digital pathology. This, this means large label images and large volume tables. Um, and to solve this problem, we've introduced something that we call internally workflow engine and processing engine. It really is background task processing and management and queuing system. It's, it's a distributed system that allows us then to scale the, the background tasks as well as needed and execute them in an asynchronous fashion. Um, also to lower the deployment burden as we go from, so we don't deploy in, in sadly in one environment, we always deploy on, on, well, we often deploy on premises more and more often in the cloud, but the, the environment might be different. So we decided to use for most of those background tasks and processing uh, containers and, and currently we're shipping Singularity and Docker by default. So these are kind of the pieces we have already built and, and delivered to our customers this year and they, they're running pretty happily in production systems. So I'll say the next um, couple of, of uh, spend the next couple of minutes describing what, what we're about to build in the next 12 to 18 months or what we set ourselves to build. So um, as the next step we're planning to further extend the um, cloud native nature of Omero Plus, and that's all in works currently. Um, we don't have any deadlines in here in the roadmap, but this is kind of near term. In the next uh, few months, we will be delivering OME and GFF support generation free, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a second as well. Um, broader support for token-based authentication and authorization. So as we are including more and more single sign-on um, integrations, we also need to provide third-party applications to use the tokens and use single sign-on um, features. Um, that includes our own, Omero Insight, but also all the high-performance computing cluster tools we are deploying and, and other third-party image processing and analysis tools. Um, so with these foundations built on the top of authorization and OME and GFF, um, we're hoping to later next year split Omero MS from Omero microservices from the Omero server and provide truly standalone services that can be deployed exactly at the location of the data, which will provide us this modular architecture for Omero Plus. With the workflow engine and processing engine now happily running segmentation and import tasks, uh, we are looking into extending those into system and background monitoring threads and providing the dashboards for the data administrators, the scientists, and the system administrators with the notification about the system status. And I'll show you a couple of screenshots in, in a second as well, so uh, you can see what we're thinking about there. But this is also uh, to make sure that, that managing these systems becomes easier. Uh, rather than hand, harder when we extend them. And of course, data mining interfaces and API. So we're bringing in a lot of analytical data and analytical results with the background processing. We can um, now process this data further, derive more uh, data summaries and prepare them for, for plotting and visualization and exploration. So that's kind of the things we're, we're thinking about uh, next. And of course, all of these components uh, we're building up towards uh, those really tailored solutions in the key domains, high content screening and digital pathology. What we really want to build on these uh, foundations of, of cloud native Omero Plus and workflow engines is cell and tissue phenotyping workflows, object level data mining, artificial uh, intelligence model tuning. I'll show you a couple of tools that we're currently using to run the segmentation, both for high content screening and digital pathology directly from Omero Web. Um, whole slide image and high content screening image analysis, and obviously reporting. So all of that, if we want to provide a really global, a truly global uh, data management system, needs to come from our interfaces. Moving the data around in the cloud, as, a, as we know, is, is actually challenging and expensive. So um, that, that's, that, that's where we're going with, with Omera Plus in the next few months. So uh, I will not take questions now. I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and do the application showcase and, and we can probably do that in the end. I hope that's, that's okay. And that will be extension of the roadmap. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the features we've listed there and, and I wasn't really very explicit about what they mean. So I'll do that here and I'll show a couple of screenshots as well. So you can guys 
um, get a better impression of, of what we're thinking about. So why do we need generation three of OME and GFF? Uh, well, uh, we're, we're set up now to uh, support multi-bucket installations. So we very often have hybrid, installation, hybrid installations these days as well, where Omero Plus, for example, runs locally on the premises, but data is stored in the buckets and, and those buckets need to be accessible. So we need flexibility in credentials provider. So uh, we don't really want to use single cloud provider. We, we, might, we want to use different ones. Our customer base is worldwide, just, just like our company. And um, it happens to be that depending on which continent you are or which coast, uh, the cloud provider uh, is slightly different and, and different cloud providers used for, for your data management. So, uh, and most importantly, improved performance and especially improved uh, uh, performance for OME and GFF import uh, to, to the server. A uh, couple of interesting, I guess, um, extensions is the integration of OME and GFF closer to the core server functionality. That's replacement of the current pixel data process, which some of you may know. It's 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 the it's the process that generates the pyramids. If the if we if we're dealing with the large images without the pyramid, um, we will work on replacing that that old architecture with the new that uses OME and GFF for for storing the pyramids and the background processing to generate those pyramids as as we go along. So uh, we, we hope to improve the um, the performance there of of those images as well. Um, and again, the broader token-based authentication and authorization, that's the single sign-on support for Omero inside, the CLI tools, the APIs, uh, high-performance computing cluster installations, but also third-party um, processing uh, applications. One example I can give you guys is, is we've actually built some of the bidirectional integrations with image processing tools, commercial image processing tools, and we already use tokens there for authentication with, with that particular infrastructure. So we've already tested uh, some of the pieces here and, and just generalizing them um, so that we can use them, for example, to, to build the modular architecture for our microservices as well. As I said, we when we're thinking about a global system, uh, we really need to have improved workflows, notifications, and monitoring for the system administrators, for example. Um, so it's great to do your work. And um, keep in mind, so this is the Omero Plus admin panel concept. It's, it's a complete concept, so it may not bear any resemblance of what you're seeing today once it's released into production, but I'll use it to just... Uh, to just um, Kind of highlight what we're thinking about and what we're currently doing with the background processes and wh why they will be useful uh, going forward. So here we have the standard Omero system administrator uh, workflow where we have the users and group management, but we also want to provide things like notifications. And those notifications will not only include in client notifications, but webhook and get a direct message to your Slack channel or OME or or the Teams uh, and get the emails when something happens, right? And to actually think about um, the monitoring tools that are out there. They're not application specific. They're, they're monitoring particular URLs or other things. So here we are proposing to build something that will specifically monitor installation based on our experience over the last few years that, that we've gathered. Um, so monitor the core services like Omero Web and Omero Server, but the database backend and the session store and the pixel buffer. And then as as more as as we add more localized services in the global distribution, we of course want to monitor all of the services and make sure that they all work and, and perform um, uh, the same. So we provide the best uh, value to the end user. In most of our large scale installations, there isn't a single mount uh, for the data. We have various mounts added to the system, and Omara is using them for in place imports. For example, we need to make sure that those are available because many, and I'll show you that in the import, um, I don't know if you can see on the left in the admin panel, there's also import menu, and I'll describe this in a second, where we really need to make sure that those mounts are available uh, to us and to Omero to perform automated imports uh, on behalf of the users. And as I said, uh, we've built the processing and workflow engine mostly to start with the segmentation, conversion, and stitching tasks. This you can see on the bottom here. This is coming directly from the queue, and you can actually see um, the task status, depending subtask and, and processing jobs that are appearing, that, that's already um, this part, the task part, as I said before, is, is shipped to our customers in production. We also have here appearing imports and other things, but that, that's coming kind of later um, next year. 
Um, the imports presented here are not drag and drop my file here and make it import to Omero. We are very often in the production uh, scale interface with various mostly high content screening instruments and we perform automated sync of the data acquired by these instruments to Omero. Uh, currently all of that works via server side configuration files and automated uh, sync process. Here we'll provide some interfaces for the data managers mostly to actually schedule the, those imports and make sure that they appear on time and, and have a way to, in, uh, to validate that the import process has run, whether there was no issues with connection to the database and other things. So this is completely automated workflow and it has nothing to do with adding HTTP endpoint for uploading the data. It's just configuration for, for file synchronization between various systems. And the usage reports, we're finding out that this is one of the most important tasks that, that the data managers would perform actually in our commercial environment, we need to provide information about number of new users, number of unique logins to the system, number of total logins per year, um, number of imported images, etc. You really need to know what value you're providing to the end users and, and whether that system is actually doing uh, what you're expecting and, and whether there is an interest in your organization, for example, um, to, use, to use that particular um, infrastructure. Um, but also um, simpler things like I really want to know when most of the data is imported. Is it on, on Monday or is it on Friday? When are people logging in to do the work on Omero? Is it Wednesday or Thursday? When we're scheduling updates and upgrades and we need to take the system down for a number of hours, uh, those simple things like this will allow us then to, to make these predictions better and actually choose the, the better times for, for interacting with the system and, and potentially taking it offline. So there's, there's quite a few thing is that we want to, where, where it's simply a quality of life improvement because most of this functionality is already there. So we'll be wrapping them around into interfaces that are easier to, to explore. Next part of the updates, um, really thinking about, and, and I've spent quite a lot of time already talking about the analytical workflows and handling analytics. Um, we're running quite a lot of installations where digital pathology and high content screening segmentation is the part of, of, of our system. We have um, a, either AWS batch connection or high performance computing clusters sitting locally connected to Omero, where we do run these analysis. Um, we currently store all of the data in Omero uh, tables, uh, but typical experiment handling 2 million objects with hundreds of columns. It's not where Omero tables shine, let's say. So we're currently looking into a new backend for Omero tables. We know that getting into spatial genomics, large three-dimensional data sets, we really need to provide support for spatial queries. Uh, that's uh, absolutely a must and requirement also in digital pathology workflows where we really want to dive into particular regions of, uh, of the image to understand what's happening there, but also we really need a way to, to perform some of the visualizations on the fly. So we really need a... Uh, database with the spatial index that will understand what we're asking for in, in, in the spatial context. Um, our current plan is also to provide a dedicated microservice to perform the queries uh, in those larger Omero tables. Um, and that's, that's really the need based on the pure and sheer volume of that data. Um, and and as, as, we, as we're working through the updates to the backend, we'll also make sure that the Omero tables API um, gets modernized and easier to use and uh, with things like, for example, Python toolboxes, Pandas, et cetera. So, so you'll get better way or easier way of loading your data in and saving it back to the server. Um, with the Omero microservices, it obviously means that there'll be an HTTP or uh, REST API endpoint that we can use for, for operating on the tables. And a couple of examples now of how we utilize Omero tables already in their current state. There's nothing special done here. Um, we use kind of special column naming to, to, to interact with the data. But uh, again, it's, it's what you'll see here is, is mostly open source Omero. So we made a couple of changes to Omero tables and those were actually proposed to open source. And I think they're already merged. Uh, so we improved the, the performance there. Um, the image you're seeing it was shared with us by RareSight and uh, acquired with Orion system. It's actually quite interesting. This particular image has, uh, I think, around 20 channels. Oh, we're looking at only one. That's the nuclear staining here. Um, you've probably seen some of the, of the uh, workflow I'll show in a second 
um, if you've been here last year, uh, Aaron Deal was, was showing actually a demo of how Pavior is consuming uh, OME and GFF labels to, to do the segment or show the segmentation at scale. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you here in a second. Um, so today you can run with Omero Plus analysis with Stardust and Cellpost out of the kind of uh, from, from Omero Web uh, with the background processing task and bring in all the analysis uh, results into Omero. Um, as I said, you probably last year have seen those beautiful color coded objects that we've segmented with, with one of the uh, deep learning tools, and that's still the case. Uh, we have connected now Omero tables backend, so we can only not color code them by particular values, but also filter. And what you see here is color coding by the, uh, by the object sets, but we can use any other metric calculated in the pipeline and connect it to this particular label image to do the visualization filtering uh, and feature extraction. Um, with OME and GFF labels, we've actually realized that we're very close to do some of the statistical post-processing and we can summarize the data that, that we've segmented at, at some area um, you did levels. For example, here we're seeing a heat map so we can pretty nicely use the existing uh, summary, uh, existing object level tables to create summary tables and create new label images to, to perform uh, the visualizations that will highlight the areas of interest. Here we're obviously looking at something probably not very interesting. You can do that with intensities already of the particular channel, but that's just a summary. And, and you can clearly see objects and structures already within the image and then use the object level metadata to drill into, in, into this further. So PubViewer, the latest PubViewer already supports all of this technology. So this, this is actually a, a production, uh, an image from the production instance. And on the right there, you can also see the required technology stack in order to make this happen. And we'll make more improvements here for PubViewer to be also able to, to do some of these things on the fly, like requesting the particular polygons on label mask within particular region. This is why I said that spatial indexing is incredibly uh, important. Um, another example of, of what we're thinking about, um, and as I said in the beginning, we actually want to look at the cell um, and tissue level classification workflows. Um, this is, again, this is a development. Um, um, so we call this application Omero Pageant. I should say that. Omero Pageant is under active development. This is a screenshot from the UI from um, late last week, I think. Um, this UI will obviously change before we go into the production, but that will be the interface for object level data mining. So you can see that the image is not playing a main role in here. We're actually looking for the tables. The reason for that is if we're looking for a very rare event and have very large images, it's often difficult to visualize a single cell or tens of cells in the, in the pool of two millions. Uh, on that image. So here we change the interface to drive it via those cells. So what you can see here is the table with the uh, analytical results uh, from the segmentation, um, a gallery of objects pulled directly from OME and GFF label, uh, sorry, uh, image. And on the top, there are polygons. Those polygons are not shapes or ROI stored in Omero. These are actually features from the table itself. And we'll use those features then to combine them with, with what you've seen in PubViewer in terms of filtering. Uh, to provide you a way to, to find the, um, the objects of interest and start the classification and, and start binning those into particular terms. Um, and again, um, it's exactly the same required technology stack. We need OME and GFF label images and masks. That's what we're currently using here. Uh, we have the Omero tables for the objects measurement. Uh, we're working on the spatial index support. Um, Omero tables microservice to actually perform these queries at scale. As we said, there's 3 million rows with, I think the latest table which produces 600 columns. So that is a challenging um, um, process. Um, the larger image you see in here is embeddable PubViewer, but I will not spend any time uh, talking about this. If, if there's any interest later, we can obviously discuss this. And we have the background tasks and task monitoring to produce uh, some of the visualizations and histograms and other things that will be coming into this interface uh, later next year. And the last piece I'll show you that, that we'll use to actually provide tele, 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 uh, tailored solutions, sorry, in, in those key domains is um, what we are currently calling Amaro AI. This is, again, concept um, that we proposed for building interface, web interface for Stardust, Cellpose, 
and cell profiler so that we could actually do some of the model fine tuning or pipeline tuning right in the in the web or Omera web client. Um, we found that it's difficult to get an interface for Stardust or Cellpos and for the user to, to actually pick one of the six parameters that I have in here and, and get the correct model for my data. So we'll provide some interfaces to for you before submitting analysis at scale. Uh, we often run tens or hundreds of images at once uh, with scaling. So we really want you to know which parameters to pick before you run uh, the analysis and that interface. Um, with, with its current concept, will also host the pixel painting models, uh, retraining and, and fine tuning. So again, large scale analysis um, with AI and deep learning models. And that takes us to what we think of, um, of these single pieces I was just describing. So all of them are very valuable to us because we can build um, solutions tailored to particular domain. And so what you see here, is the full vertical solution, for example, for high content screening, where we get an image uh, with, if it's OME NGFF, uh, NGFF format, that's great. We can actually use it with the object storage, for example. Uh, but um, if you look at utilizing OME NGFF to achieve scalable cloud-based analysis with Cell Profiler, that's a poster that David and Mina presented at this year's SBI2, that's on our website. Um, you can find that OME and GFF with the um, native reader and cell profiler already provides um, quite a bit of an improvement in performance uh, when accessing the images, even on the standard um, storage systems today. Um, it's even better if you if you if you have if you compare OME and GFF versus tips in in the in the S3 storage. That that seems to be. Um, pretty nice solution for also the analysis. So the full vertical stack for high content screening will include the, the right file format that we can we can ship around and use the best storage for for a particular solution we'll have the segmentation connector to provide you with the segmentation tools um omero parade and pageant working together with parade uh, image level metadata um mining at the screen and plate level and with pageant deep diving into the classification and phenotyping workflows at the object level and finally, Omero AI to actually have an interface for training and execution of those deep learning artificial intelligence models. And you can, you, you'll notice here that we've selected those products and we're building those products on the foundations of the cloud native and, and workflow and processing engines, because we can, we can now tailor the solution also to digital pathology in very similar fashion. So we'll have an OME and GFF format to represent this whole, uh, whole slide images we can now store them where it makes the most sense locally or in the cloud we can use the segmentation connectors cell post start this tensorflow models to do the segmentations we've actually built our own tools you can kind of shy on this slide but it's omero segmentation whole slide image uh connector it takes care of tiling the the images running segmentation per tile putting it all together just like omero cell profiler connector that some of you may, may be already using uh combine those matrices together create the label images import them to omero uh, calculate the metrics for, for all the objects that, that were uh, identified during the segmentation and bring them back as tables to Omero for visualization as well. And then we'll have the pub viewer to drive the visualization from, from the object level perspective and we'll have parade and pageant to, again, uh, the data mining interfaces depending on which, which level you want to work and Omero AI, AI to, to help you to choose the right parameters for, for your analysis. And, and that will, uh, we hope, provide the the solution. So uh, with your terabyte scale imaging and, and our image informatics solutions, um, I hope will will we'll help you extract the knowledge from your images. So um, yes, as, as, as stated here, I hope we'll get to work together at some point with all or some of you at least. Uh, I now thank you for your attention. As, as Chris mentioned in his last slide, we are hiring, we are looking for an application specialist and a technical writer. So if what you've seen here um, you now with with the uh, with with our roadmap, if you find that interesting and, and like to help us out building these solutions, uh, please you can find more information on on our website. So that's it from me. Uh, I don't know, Chris, if you want to add anything um, at the end there. Thank you, Emil. 
there's been a whole series of questions in the chats. I think most of those have um, been addressed. Anything? I won't read through them. I'm sure you guys can. I think everything's been addressed. Anything we've missed or any other questions? Hands up. Any questions on the whole presentation? Or the directions we're going? As Jason mentioned, there were a variety of questions. I'll hopefully I've managed to answer all, all of them to people's satisfactions. Um, Here's one last from Ken, Chris. I won't try to. Um, yeah, it's it's a good question, Ken. That what we're trying to do now is to develop, and hopefully over the next bit, also extend some of the great work that uh, Chamari and Peter and others have started uh, on the open source side to uh, expand the training portfolio and to actually you know, have opportunities to, to do those, um, both in person and remote, hopefully. Um, so just trying to augment what the great work that the OME team has already started, um, and also have some things focused more on a couple of roles that, uh, I think, you know, you've seen in the chat there that people are asking questions about, you know, sort of the data manager role, the person who's kind of managing Omero and trying to uh, handle a large install uh, and also the data scientist uh, type type role. So just trying to augment those uh, as best we can and trying to, to deliver content for those people who want to make use of, um, of Omero. others us trying to make as much of it as possible um brought back to the open source community uh laurent trying trying to do as much as we can to get to expand the platform to do that um and just and try to keep the the things that are really domain specific um as omero plus only so trying to do as much as we can Sometimes these things that you see are actually funded by customers or direct work with customers. So it's sometimes hard for us to bring those things back, but um, we try our best to, to bring as much of them back as we can. Goodness. Any more general questions just on the direction we're going? Various um, points from the morning, IDR, et cetera. Five more seconds. I see several people who I think are in um, impressive time zones. So for those of you for whom it's still dark, thank you for joining us. I will apologize to Erin um, Deal. I think I introduced her. It's about well, when that, that talk started, it was about 4 a.m. her local time. So she will be uh, joining us in the afternoon. So I apologize for that. Um, uh, right. If not, I'd say it's time, at least in the UK, it's time for another cup of coffee. Um, speaking quite personally. Um, I will, um, I'll tell you what, what I will do is happy to leave this open for, leave the call open just for um, informal chats for those of you who want to do that. Um, I'm gonna run downstairs and grab a cup of coffee. And I'll be right back. Um, and then we'll keep the call open until 10 o'clock just for informal chats. But I think um, that's the, that's, we were, we're done with the program that we wanted to cover. Um, wish you all well. And what are your more precise? Oh, that's an interesting question, Oliver. <laughs> How much time do we have? 
Yeah, can I get can I get the coffee first? <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm sure you would, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, short answer. It is definitely yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So why don't we do um, five or six minute coffee break, and then we'll uh, reconvene here suitably. Um, uh, stimulated. We'll have a few minutes um, to talk about that question. All right. All right. Talk, talk to you all in a second. Cheers. I'm glad that wasn't recorded. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. And try to answer all the questions quickly before Ken has to depart. So. Right. Uh, we is Oliver back? He asked the question. So. I, I don't see him yet. So, so I'll wait like one more minute. Uh. I'm gonna, mindful of time. Um, so I'll start out with spatial transcriptomics. I think others will want to jump in here. Um, so the, so many of you know, when someone says, well, what are your precise future plans for spatial, spatial transcriptomics? Um, it's actually kind of, so what, what spatial transcriptomics are we talking about? There's, as many of you know, there's many different modalities and spatial profiling is, is exploding in lots of different ways. Um, Emil, for example, shows some of Glencoe's work with um, data from rare site. Um, so that's more on the spatial protein um, profiling. That's what that'll be imaging with um, fluorescent antibodies. Uh, lots of, there's already data in the IDR from imaging mass cytometry. With respect to things like Visium, um, et cetera. So maybe taking a step back, um, Francis showed you data in the IDR, in situ sequencing, um, single molecule fish, et cetera. So all of that is there. So if you're thinking more in the MRFish, space then all of that is you know they basically that is data that would already go into bioformats in the marrow if you're thinking more on the visium type of uh, technology so that so visium um geomix nanostring etc um so you could probably look at the plans that Emil and Chris were talking about with respect to regions and features and tables and think about how all of that could go together. Um, Chris, would you add anything? Chris or Emil, would you add anything to that? I don't think so, Jason. I'm, I mean, as you said, Emil's, there's a couple of screenshots there. I mean, we didn't lean into that. I think we could probably spend a whole hour talking about the things that we're trying to do there from a visualization perspective based on the infrastructure there. Um, it'll be no surprise to anyone. We're talking to all of those instrumentation vendors that you mentioned, um, Jason, and trying to do some, you know, trying to think about how to handle the data um, and to put the infrastructure in place to be able to do stuff with it. Um, it's just a whole, you know, I think it's a whole different scale when you're trying to to work with um with this heavily uh spatially resolved um data, right? On the on the IDR side, so I gave you the examples of data and the Francis showed you examples that we have so far. There are various um, efforts for public data sets around single cell transcriptomics. So Fabian Tisa's lab, um, Chris Sanders' lab have just published various resources. So that's single cell data. Obviously there's cell by gene, et cetera, and all that whole world. And we're working with a few different groups trying to publish 
uh, I guess, Visium data um, using OME and GFF and all of that is other people's work, but that's com so that's coming, I guess I would um, say, and you'll see that um, over the next little while here. Um, yeah, so hopefully that, so unfortunately, Oliver, you asked for precise, and that's not precise, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, there we go. And um, 3D and 4D. Uh, easy way to have volume visualization with the marrow. Um, um, had some conversations with Web, Webnosis guys. Chris or Emilia, do you want to start that off? Um, Josh? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think we all know that is like right now the all of this community is is essentially two D only, and that's not going to last forever. <laughs> um, for sure. I mean, I think the advantage we all have is that we've been doing multi we've been doing multi dimensional work for so long in kind of standard fluorescence that conceptually these things uh shouldn't be a big deal but um the practical realities of handling the data are certainly there go ahead josh and i think i mean there's there's obviously a theme to what uh we've set up here to talk about uh, in terms of solutions and what we're interested in um I think that really gets to the fact that we need an API. We need a way to access this data across multiple tools. So a possibility is that Omero clients, in addition to other clients like WebNosis and you know, run the full spectrum, you'll hear a lot more about those on Thursday, um, will access the data directly. You know, so this is something I said at Elmi, um, and I was trying to be controversial to, to lead into a deeper discussion, and everyone just nodded at me, and that's maybe fine. Um, but Omero, you know, when we set Omero up, it we created a nut, yet another proprietary API, right? You know, we put something in place, and applications do need to be written to it. Um, so, to some degree, a lot of what we're talking about is taking a step back and going, okay, can we? define something that's more generic, more universal that we all agree on. And that then can be what future applications are built against, right? So um, the tools that will come up on Thursday do start to bring us into the 3D space. What we will need to do is make sure as a community that Omero is then providing that access, providing that endpoint, which is you know all these points that that Glencoe was going through. Well, you, then you need to think about authentication. You need to think about various forms of storage. You know, these are all the problems we as a community have to solve, but then we have access to a, a wide range of tools for visualization that we can plug together, all based on kind of this common, this common idiom that we're working and working on and discussing over the next couple of days. Definitely, Josh. Yeah, I mean, just to kind of double down on that, Certainly what we hear over and over again is we want Omero to be the the conduit for access to this data. We want it to handle the permission system. That's where all my other metadata is. That's where the images are. That I, I want that to be the uh, the central point. And and certainly we're we're definitely hearing that as well about NGFF, right? Um starting to have a lot of our customers come with okay, well, I've got my imaging data in this storage system, but I have my label images and my analytics in another storage system. The idea that everything is going to be in the same place is just, you know, not the case, right? Um, you heard of that from Emil. Um, a lot of our customers are doing acquisition at one site and then analytical uh, workflows at another. So um, having to handle that and having to work with with authorization tooling that is just simply not suited well for this type of data. Uh, if anyone here has tried to get, tried to have a hundred different people have access to the same S3 bucket uh, and work with the data, that's, you know, they, you're going to have a rough time, right? Um, so definitely trying to get, to be the not not have to hold everything internally, but at least uh, be the broker um, as as best we can. Cool. 
mindful of the time. I don't think there's any follow-up questions there. Hopefully, I mean, those are vague mm -hmm. answers, but um, I think they represent the challenge that um, we're up against. So hopefully that gives you some idea of the directions. Um, and I uh, just highlight uh, with respect to the spatial TX question, um, Josh's link in the chat. That's actually, um, I should have mentioned that. It's a really great point. And yeah, um, that will be important. And finally, the just to reiterate the point that Josh made is, is that the idea that Amaro is the single point through all through which all things go that may have sufficed in 2007, eight or so, but that's clearly not going to be the strategy um, going forward. So um, it's uh, top of the hour. If there aren't any other questions, gonna wish you all well. Um, we'll run the similar, like, more or less the identical session if you want to participate in that discussion starting at 4 p.m. GMT. You saw that you know the schedule for the next few days. Um, very much hope to see many of you there. Um, th those will be much more uh, focused sessions on specific um, reviewing the status of the technology and then discussing and hopefully working on um, directions forward. Um, so with that, I just want to thank you all for joining us. It's great to see you all. I hope we can um, be able to uh, share an in-person meeting together soon and um, have a great day, okay? All right, thanks, Gus. Just.